Thanks a lot, and it's always a, a pleasure to get together. And I think one of the, the big things about Fabry disease is how it's really enhanced my connection. Uh, it's helped me connect with patient groups, it's helped me connect with other scientists, with industries, uh, and all around the world. And for me, making a little four hour journey, it's allowed me to connect with some who made a 24 hour journey. So that's quite a great privilege. Now, hopefully, something will happen. And here we are, this is my home base in, uh, in Royal Perth Hospital where I've been working for the, the last three decades and it's always a, a fun place to, to start. And you don't have to have an incredibly expensive or incredibly difficult therapy if you, and you'll find that you end up with a, a lot of benefit just with simple things, simple things and the things that your GP or any general physician or, you know, can provide to you will often make people feel a lot better. So if you've got a common sense approach to pain, you can avoid the things which make you feel pain. If you've got things which make you feel bloated or constipation or diarrhea, then many people deal with these on a day-to-day on a -day basis. And I'm gonna connect with my young daughter down in Kiama this, later this evening, and she suffers these, and I give her all these uh, standard advice that she's worked out for herself. And she's, you've got the things which might cause anybody to have a heart attack, and. We give the, the aspirin, the cholesterol pills, and those for kidney disease. We've got our standard preventers. If anybody's had a heart attack or has an arrhythmia, we've got lots and lots of good therapies available. And uh, even for people who have deafness, and I'm wearing my hearing aids at the moment, and they've helped me too. So lots of common therapies available you don't have to be very specialised for. The things which are specific for Fabry's disease have been incredibly exciting. And the, the breakthrough of enzyme replacement therapy just revolutionised many people's lives and it's been a, an enormous advance. And we've now got these new exciting advances of the chaperone therapy, which has uh, helped a lot of people by freeing them from intravenous infusions and now they just don't have to take a pill. And we've got our new th therapies too, the, the new pill by the substrate reduction and our gene therapy. So these are the, the pros and the cons of the, the intravenous therapy. It uh, requires generation from cell lines, it requires an intravenous infusion. The, they, they don't go instantaneously, it takes uh, several hours. For some people they can get infusion reactions, which can be quite you know, difficult and in general are managed by just slowing down the infusion rather than developing life-threatening anaphylaxis, but it can occur for some people. And sometimes the actual antibodies that you perform actually then start chewing away the effectiveness of the effusion, so you're actually getting a reaction and no benefit. The proof of these in clinical trials is always tricky, and, uh, and Kathy beautifully showed sort of the upsides and the downsides. And when you've got a, a very niche disease with only a, a small number of people, and you've got so much variation between each person as an individual, then trying to prove that this treatment works compared to the inactive treatment becomes almost statistically impossible. And one of the, the fascinating things, now Rog, this hasn't got a pointer, but if you look at the graphs on the left, it show how much the pain reduced for the people who got the active therapy on the left part of the left, and then on the placebo group, the people who got no active therapy, lo and behold, their pain got better too. And it just beautifully reinforces the benefit of actually being part of clinical trials. It, when you are shown that you are cared for, it's an enormous relief. Just sometimes that relief and that reduction in anxiety helps everybody. But even though things get better, they're not really cured. It's a way of slowing things down, improving, but not necessarily controlling. And so all those graphs start high on the left, but they don't go to zero on the right. And if you look at your kidneys, you can clear out the blue dots of uh, gunk, <laughs> as, as we learnt this morning, and they reduce, but they don't go away. And you can see that if you tried to broadly divide people into people who got the treatment and didn't get the treatment, that looks like there's things build up in those who don't get it and those who get better if they do, still there's a big wide bars it's just supposed to show just the difference between those who got a lot and those who got a little. And once again, it's just a test to how different we all are. 
And this is that uh, amazingly brave Dr. Tondell in Norway, or as we know as now, North America. <laughs> And just how incredible it was that all the little blue dots went from a lot of the top left right down to a little if they got enough enzymes for long enough. But the variant between people is just incredible. And you'll have, yes, they're men, yes, they're women. And sure, they should be different, but there's incredible overlap. And then you've got kidney disease in Fabry's, and yes, you've got mild disease, yes, you've got severe disease, but look at the, the spread of difference. Everybody has their own story. And you've got other big registries, and to participate in a registry is an incredible chance for that connection right around the entire globe. And if you can get your data without your name, but actually helping out all the scientists, all the epidemiologists, all the, the companies, they all start to realise what a difference you can make. It's, it's an incredibly empowering um, way of proving it. For your heart disease, once again, the overall uh, initial studies seem to be this dramatic difference. But as you start to tease it out, you can see that once again, there are some that do benefit and then some that don't. Everybody has their own story. And you've also got not just the thickness of the heart, but how the heart functions as a muscle. We often think of these as explained as simple pumps in and out. But what you actually see with a hump heart is more like wringing out your um, uh, a wet towel. And it's, it, as it twists, it strains. And that ability to strain or not strain is really impacted by whether it's got scar or no scar. And you can use all the active treatment you like but if something's already scarred, it's like having a, a towel that's already partly stiffened. And so there are some parts where you, the enzymes will look like it's really helping, and other parts where it's actually, the scar is shrinking. It's not that the thickened muscle is getting better. The Canadians, bless their hearts, have done an incredible job to try and approach this scientifically. And in the middle of this incredible job, they suddenly discovered that the people who were randomised to Fabrizyme couldn't get Fabrizyme because there was a bug in their bioreactor. And so this global shortage of one half of the scientific experiment completely wrecked the experiment. But nevertheless, they plugged on beautifully. And they've shown that, in essence, if you do get onto any therapy, you can nearly uh, slow the event, the, the new events, by about, uh, by about two thirds. So it's a really a, a threefold reduction in your chance of having a stroke or a heart event or a kidney event by getting onto therapy. So a huge thumbs up for the effort that's gone into the science, the effort that, that uh, patients went through to have these therapies. And when the therapy ran out, uh, there were some people who would reduce the doses and take it a little bit, but keep on with the same therapy. In Western Australia, we made a holus bolus decision to say, look, everybody gets um, Replegal instead of Fabrizyme, and we'll just make sure we have a regular dose of something, a lower dose. And then we were never quite sure whether we're doing well or doing badly. And once again, it becomes almost impossible to tell scientifically because each person has their own story. But this was a, an overall um, analysis of all those people who were swapped, and it looked like that their kidney function stayed stable, that's the GFR, is your kidney percentage, but your heart thickness was still continued to be benefited, so that the, the replicale was still working to shrink your heart. The, um, when you look at the build-up of the gunk protein, the, the lyso-GB3, it becomes a pretty good guess as to whether the, the stuff is working or not. If you look at the graph up in the top right, you can see how all those little dots dive down and then stabilise out. So if you had no Fabry's disease, you'd be right down to the bottom of the line and stay with no build-up of the lyso-GB3. If your enzyme replacement therapy didn't do a thing, then all the dots would stay up the top right and keep on going right across the page. But you can see that what you get is actually quite good reductions in therapy, but not normalisations. And there are some people who it comes down and then drifts off again. So once again, everybody has their own story and their own response. And one of the other worrying things 
is with those who do tend to get events that they tend to come in clusters. So if you do tend to get kidney disease, then it's more likely to push you into heart problems. If you do tend to get heart problems, then it's more likely to push you into kidney problems. And Fabry's is not unique in this. This happens to diabetics, this happens to non-diabetics, happens to polycystic kidney disease. It's a bit unfair that the people who get hit then get hit harder when more often. So that's why it's so important to keep that holistic therapy approach. You don't just treat your heart if you've got a heart problem, but you look at the whole person. We're lucky or cursed, depending on which way you look at it, to have a very regulated society here in Australia. We have you know, fair rules which are applied uh, consistently. So um, up until 2015, we had our life-saving drugs program that was administered with a state committee with an expert panel and they have now um, amalgamated that. They try to keep those consistent guidelines and to give them their due, they look at those guidelines and they engage with the community and they engage with the companies, they engage with the clinicians and they try and make the criteria fair and consistent. So for that, you know, I have a simple rule in life, you tell the truth and play by the rules and see how it goes. But push the boundaries from time to time. So the availability of a pill was a, a big breakthrough. And the one that is a chaperone means that it'll be useful for you if your gene is can fit in and then be stabilized. It's a bit like the difference between somebody who needs a walking chair, a walking stick versus a, a wheelchair. And if you're limp but you can benefit with a walking stick then you could be chaperoned and keep on going but if you've got a so bad that you're in a wheelchair it doesn't matter if you've got a walking stick or not it's not going to help and overall there might be about 30 to 40 percent of people with genes that would benefit from the megalostat chaperone <coughs> and it seems to be amazingly safe you know, you have a pill every two days and most people get virtually nothing at all maybe a little bit of a bloat in their um, stomach. So that's a, a fancy diagram trying to show the journey of the enzyme without a laser pointer it's probably ridiculous but it, it's made, it comes through, it clears junk, that's the little black dots and if you have a mutated gene it doesn't fold quite right and so that then the junk accumulates on the outside if you can chaperone it right, it'll go in. And to do proper science, you have to have proper scientists and clinicians and the wonderful Kathy Nichols and the, the top line there, the diminutive Mark Thomas halfway down, buried in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and in the kidney side of things, we try to look at our kidney percentage, our GFR. So 100% is fantastic. You then watch how your kidney percentage stays when you're on therapy. You'd like everybody in the world to stay with 100% kidney function all their life. Unfortunately, that's not how it goes. We all lose about 1% per year. So if you can keep your percent loss less than 1%, you're doing just normal for your age. And the amazing thing was that when you looked at the megalostat group in the blue versus the enzyme replacement therapy in the black, We've got these two different ways of doing it. A best guesstimate, which is done on a blood test, or a, a, a big M measure, which is done by an a, a enzyme, uh, sorry, a, a nuclear medicine infusion. You've got these hugely, ridiculously different results. Both of them showing that the enzyme and the megalostat were working equally well, but in the same patients received the same branch of therapies, one said that the, the kidney function was maintained within a 0.4 to 1% of normal, the other one said they were losing it 3 to 4% of normal. It makes mathematically and clinically zero sense at all, but at least we know that the therapies work. The difference between the two seemed to be that the hearts were better protected with megalostat than with the enzyme replacement therapy and that was interesting. But in little studies, you can get completely misleading or encouraging results. So is it true? We're not sure. 
something that could not be argued was the difference in the junk protein, the gunk protein. I love that line, Matt. <laughs> that and hairballs, I'm never going to forget. <laughs> and so if you've got something that works, your gunk level, your lysoGB3, comes right down and should stay down. If you're giving people this pill, you're not quite sure are they going to get a, a, something that's working or not working. You're keeping your fingers crossed. And so if people who were on enzyme and then came onto the pill, you can see over here that the two groups both kept it down. If they was on enzyme and they came down, it stayed down. And when they were swapped to the pill, it kept on staying down. But accidentally, inside the randomization of the study, there were a couple of people who got in who had genes that shouldn't have responded to the pill. They changed the assay over the halfway through. So internally, and two of them got the pill, and then two of them stayed on enzyme. And the dramatic difference between these four people who are non-amenable showed that the people who were put on the pill but shouldn't have been on the pill, their gunk levels rose straight up. So it was an accidental but beautiful proof that the pill really works. Because if you get it when you shouldn't get it, it doesn't work. Which brings me to gene therapy. <laughs> so you've got your intravenous therapies, which have their pros and cons. You've got your oral chaperone therapy, which works for some but not all. And now I've got our two research therapies, the oral reduction therapy, which works for everybody, and gene therapy. How do you do your own stem cell transplant? Oh, very easy. You just, number one, suck out some blood after giving yourself a dose, which brings up your stem cells. Number two, prune those out so you've just got your stem cells. Number three, what they call transduce with lentiviral vector. This is a, just like if you're getting a mosquito to give you malaria. The malaria gets into the mosquito as a vector and then gets into your red cells. So too, if you want to give yourself a cure for your Fabry's disease, you get a normal Fabry gene, put it into a lentivirus, and then let it insert into your stem cells. Then you reinfuse them. Now you have to damp down your immune system and your bone marrow long enough so the new stem cells can live in there. But once they get inside your bone marrow at the bottom left and then start multiplying, they come out of the bloodstream. And all these different cells in your bloodstream, your red cells, your white cells, your platelets, it's the white cells that actually have nuclei, the nuclei that has DNA and the DNA that has genes. So anything with a nucleus can then start pumping out the new Fabry gene and the new, therefore, the new enzyme. And you can have something which actually not just gets into your bloodstream, but into your cells, into your kidney cells, into your heart cells, and even into your brain cells. So we've had a phase one study, which was done by the wonderful Canadians, yet again, and the phase two study. And the Avro Bio Company reached out to Japan and, America and Australia, and it was a, a race with the two ethics committees, Royal Melbourne versus Royal Perth, which just put them across the line. <laughs> and so lo and behold, we were able to see our opening patients. Now, if you're going to play with your genes, it's, it sounds potentially pretty scary. You might, as you <laughs> mentally imagine this blind throw of a whole lot of new genes, like a dartboard with your eyes closed, as it lands in your DNA, hoping that it'll work, but not knock off something that actually should already be working. So there's the risk of gene silencing, the risk of mucking up the genes, there's the risk of uh, the virus itself, the lentivirus, behaving like a, more like a virus, rather than like a nice silent Trojan horse vector. So all these potential things have to be thought through and worked through, and you, once again, it's that leap of faith, as well as that hopefully not completely blind optimism. So if we do it all together, we can hopefully get a, a better bio and a better tech, but certainly our patients have had this uh, re remarkable 87% reduction in, the, in their lyso levels, 87% reduction in the actual um, gene gunk inside the kidney endothelial cells, and this uh, steady improvement in pain. So we've done our two, and Kathy's done her one and a half. One and a half. <laughs> and very happy to answer more therapy and more, more stories as we go. Thank you very much.
Yeah, well, so the question is how to how do you get uh, to participate in some of these amazing clinical trials? The answer is uh, ask your, your Fabry specialist uh, and they'll tell you if, are they participating and if their, your particular site isn't participating then ask them to reach out to one of the other sites that may be participating. And we've got to, uh, exactly as Cathy said, be very selective as to trying to get as uniform and as safe um, and as scientifically valid as possible. So for their stem cell therapy, it's for classic males, not yet on enzyme replacement therapy. And if you're talking about somebody who's you know, got a, a life like this and a disease like that, and then catching them just the moment before they're on enzyme replacement therapy is really like a, a snatch and grab. And at the moment, we could only find two patients in our unit that really fitted that criteria, and nobody else. So at the moment, we've got this beautiful setup, the technology that's beautifully presented, but it's a bit like opening a restaurant and having all the customers go somewhere else. <laughs> So the, the, the question was, if you're outside the, the border from one of the participating centres, can you travel? And the answer is absolutely yes. So I've had my patients in Perth that used to travel to Adelaide to participate in the Megalostat trial. So uh, almost always the, the companies will generously sponsor the, uh, the travel and accommodation and disruption for people who are brave enough to participate. New Zealand is also open as well. The question was, was it age and sex limited? And the answer is it's age limited as well. So uh, over 16, I think, under 50, or, yeah, I think it was the upper limit. Yeah, you've got to be reasonably fit to, to make sure that you're strong enough to go through. But just to reinforce that, that simple one word, connect. You know, I yeah. think, you know it's been a wonderful uh, disease and you know, for me to help make so many connections and for you to reach out and to connect as well. Hi, I'm, I'm from across the ditch. I just want to know with these trials, um, they have to have classic Fabry or two questions? Yeah, so the substrate reduction therapy I think is over, uh, open to all types of Fabrys, male and female. So, so that's uh, quite exciting. The main criteria for the one that we're involved with is, is pain. So if you haven't got pain as your main symptom, then that's the main outcome. So you need to have a pain, but it doesn't matter who it is. For the, for the gene therapy trials, currently it's classic and male. Yeah. And, I, um, and the therapy. other question I wanted to ask was, um, when these, with the presence of these clinical trials, for example in Auckland, the Metabolic Clinic, um, Dr. Cullen Wilson and Brian Edwards and Emma Glamazina, look after for the country, of our little country, um, they're aware that these are out there. Yeah, we certainly reach out and yeah, we... Yeah, because yeah. I recently um, sent um, an email a whole while back, you know, saying that they're looking for someone because it's very hard to, with a rare disease, mm. <laughs> or that's not so rare that to, to find out who the people are out there. I think Dr. Cathy might want to make another point there. Do you want to? Just, just we're in regular communication with the, the New Zealand team. That's what I hear. That's kind of what I want. Yeah.